In our Bible study, we're talking about how to interpret the Bible. And I, I told you last time, at the very end, about the fancy way to say that. And it's at the top of your page. The fancy way to talk about Bible interpretation is to say, hermeneutics. You ever heard that word before? You know? You heard it last week. There you go. So if you want to sound smart, which isn't always the goal in life, but you can talk to people and say, yeah, I'm learning a lot about hermeneutics lately. And see how they respond. Where does he live? <laughs> Dwight says, where does he live? <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right, that's just the, the technical term for talking about how we, how we study the Bible. We're, we're two weeks in, this is our third lesson, so like usual, we're going to review some of the key things that we talked about. Because the goal is this for, for it to build. Each week we're talking about some additional things that are really helpful to keep in mind when you read and interpret the Bible. So at the top you have this chart. Well, this chart, contrary to what many in our world are saying, there is absolute truth. There is absolute truth. Okay? The Bible says there is there are things that are true for everyone, no matter who they are or where they live. Truth is found in the Bible. Jesus says to God the Father, your word is truth. So we trust that truth is found in the Bible. To find the meaning of Bible verses, I This is, this is like Danny's question. He's got this one down <laughs> in his mind. But we're trying to find what did the original author originally mean to communicate to his original audience. And the word original is in there on purpose. That we're not saying, hey, what do I think this means? Or we also want to be careful not to just say, well, what does this sound like it means for us today? When you communicate with someone, you're trying to find out what is that person, what do they originally mean to say to the person they're communicating with? That's what we want to do with the Bible. What did the original author originally mean to communicate to his original audience? Okay, we're going to practice that today. Before we do, I have the, another cartoon on there, just because I know you like cartoons. <laughs> this one isn't really meant to be funny, it's meant to illustrate a difference. <clears throat> and to give you some more big words that you can use when you talk with people. So the cartoon has two big words at the top. Exegete and eisegete. You ever heard those words before? Yes. Oh, you're learning all these new things. This is good. The one on the left is meant to be good. Okay? So when I was trained to be a pastor, I was taught to be an exegete. Look at what it means. It says a person skilled in exegesis, an, an expounder of, or textual interpreter, especially of scripture. It says an exegete is like a good friend who listens to you, makes sure to understand you, and really considers everything you say. So the guy says, I totally understand what you mean, buddy. Yeah? And the difference here is this word ex means from. In Greek, it's the word for from. So if I want to try to understand someone, where is the, the best source of information going to be to understand that person? Yeah. Them. And so everything that I'm, I'm, I'm growing in, I'm learning, I want it to come from them. Okay, now this cartoon doesn't just apply it to the Bible. It works in your conversations with other people. If you really want to have a deep friendship with someone, what do you need to spend time doing? Listening to them. You need to exegize them, would be the Greek word. You need to, to pull from them as much as you can. I'm going to ask them questions. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to listen. All right, I'm going to learn, learn from them. Does this make sense? So how would we apply that to the Bible? If you want to be an exegete, if you want to use this way to understand God's Word, what are you going to do? Study the Bible. Study the Bible. 
and listen to what the Bible says and look at the context and ask questions of the Bible. When it says this, what does it mean? I want to search. All right? It's kind of like this guy. I, I, I totally understand what you mean, buddy. I want to I want to understand what the Bible's saying before I respond to it or before I start to, to put my own stuff into it. Does this make sense? The other side is the word eisegete. The Greek word eis is the word for in. So that's the only difference. Are we bringing things out, people? Or are we putting things in people? Right? So when I say a person who places meaning on a text which is not originally or inherently present in the text. So I'm putting it into it. Understand the difference? So an exegete is like an obnoxious co-worker who has selective hearing, exaggerates everything, talks over you, puts words in your mouth, and makes himself the hero of every storm. Do you know anybody like that? They're really fun to be around, right? So I'm going to act like I agree with you, but then I'll twist your words to conform to what I wish you would have said, then I'll say you said that. Okay, and this, this happens, isn't it? That you'll have a conversation with someone, then you'll hear that person describe the, the conversation to someone else. And they'll say, oh yeah, we were talking about this, and that person said, and it's totally different than what you meant. Because instead of taking meaning from you, trying to understand what you say, that person is putting their own thoughts into you, their own words into you. Okay, and that, that's not how you want to create a friendship. Okay, now, how would this look with somebody in the Bible? If instead of taking out from the Bible what's there, I come to the Bible and I think I need to put into the Bible what I want to be there, how's that going to be different? It's like the Pharisees. You say like the Pharisees, how so? They added whole, so many more rules than All right, so people, even Christian people, have had the habit of adding extra rules to the Bible. Kind of like, oh, you know, God, I hear what you say, but you should have gone farther. You should have said this, or you should have said this. And so we're going to make people do these things too. Okay? That, that's not what we're looking to do, not to add things into the Bible. What else might that look like? If instead of saying, I'm just going to sit here and take in what the Bible says, I'm going to put my thoughts in, what might that look like? Yeah, like false ideas or false teaching or think prosperity about prosperity gospel. Yeah, the prosperity gospel, right? If you just believe this, it's going to be great for you. Or maybe today we hear so many people say, "Well, that's old fashioned." Maybe so. The Bible says that, but that's that's old fashioned. We've moved on from that. We progressed past that. Okay, what this cartoon is just helping us do is this is true, and just our relationship with other people. But it becomes especially true with the Bible. If you want to have a, a deep relationship with someone, it's based on you doing everything possible to understand them. It's not based on you being obnoxious and forcing yourself onto them. Okay? We want to treat God's Word the same way. Our goal is just to let God speak. It's not to make God say what we want Him to say. It's to let God speak and understand. You have any questions about that? So you may never ever see these words again. But if you ever do, this is a good thing. Exegesis. That's what we pastors are trained to do. Study the Bible and learn from it. Okay? The opposite would be a bad thing, which would be look at the Bible and put my own thoughts into it. We want to learn from it, not put into it. Okay, let's turn the page. Last time, we talked about the fact that when we read the Bible, we're reading a sacred text. That's important to remember. At the top is a phrase that we used a lot last time. It says, anyone who does not understand the subject matter will not make sense of the words. Can someone explain that to us? Somebody who was here last week? Anyone who does not understand the subject matter will not make sense of the words. 
Could you give an example of that, Danny? So like if you're reading something about small engine repair, but you know nothing about engines, you won't know what they're talking about. Perfect example. So if you're reading like a mechanic guide to small engine repair and you know nothing about engines, you will probably know what the different individual words are. But you won't be able to understand what it's saying. We've all had that happen. You look at some instructions for something and then you put them down. And you find somebody else to put it together, right? Right? So it's not just a matter of knowing what the words mean. It's a matter of knowing what the whole subject matter is. Last time we gave examples of this happens like in medical fields. You can have two medical people talking and the rest of us have no idea what they're talking about or two military people talking or maybe even two religious people talking or two Christians talking and other people don't understand. If you, if you don't know what the main thing is, you're not going to get the individual words. Okay, Tim? My two brothers, brother-in-law and my father, they were all mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I wasn't, so when I was listening to them, I didn't understand anything that was going on. Terry's got a good example. His own family he's had relatives who were mechanics, and he says, when I would listen to them, I wouldn't know what was going on. Okay, now this is true for the Bible too. It's not just a matter of knowing English words to understand the Bible. You need to know what the Bible is all about to be able to understand the message that it has. So I've got a chart on your page there. Understanding the subject matter of the Bible. Look at number one. You got to do both columns. It says, What is the Bible? What is the Bible not? And then, what's the purpose of the Bible? What is not the purpose of the Bible? What two messages does the Bible use to teach us about Jesus? I want you to take maybe two or three minutes on your own or with the people at your tra table. Try to fill out that chart. And even if you weren't here last time, I bet you can put down some worthwhile answers. But see how you can do filling in those five questions. All right, I don't hear too much discussion happening. So let's talk all together. What is the Bible? The Word of God. Excellent. The Bible is the Word of God. What is the Bible not? Good. It's not a rule book. Not just an instruction manual. It's not just a, a story like a myth or a legend. Not just a nice story. It's God's Word. Okay? That, that's a, a basic thing that to really understand the Bible's message, you, you need to understand this is the Word of God. Good. Number two, what is the purpose of the Bible? To show us Jesus. To show us salvation by faith in Jesus. That's the purpose of the Bible. From beginning to end, Old Testament and New Testament, the Bible was written that we would believe that Jesus is our Savior. What's not the purpose of the Bible? So? Make you feel good about you. Like, just... Good. It's not just like this self-confidence building. You know, it's not meant to just make you feel good about you. It certainly does make you feel good, but it makes you feel good about what God has done for us. Good. And you could say it's not like a self-help manual. What else is the Bible not? Not a fairy tale. Not a fairy tale? What's, I'm sorry, we're doing what's not the purpose of the Bible. Oh, I thought you were talking about 
Yeah, I did too, but I'm not. I'm actually on the second one. <laughs> John? It's not meant to entertain. Good. It's not just this, this entertainment. Okay, I mean, there's been some pretty well-made movies about the Bible. That's a nice thing, but just to remember, it's not, it's not about a movie. Right? It's not, I go to the theater and eat popcorn, and this is kind of cool. It's meant to change my heart and life. Good. Its purpose isn't just to show us how to live. It's not just to do these steps type of a thing. It's to show us our Savior Jesus. John? The purpose is not to sit on the shelf and make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> there you go. The purpose is not to sit on the shelf. Maybe you're sit on like on the coffee table, you know, in the middle of the room. It's not just a decoration. It's meant to be read and used. Finally, number three, what two messages does the Bible use to teach us about Jesus? Law and gospel. Law and gospel. So everything the Bible says can be divided up into law and gospel. What does the law do? It shows us our sins. So much of the Bible, the purpose is to show us our sins. What does the gospel do? Show us our Savior. Right? Maybe you can tell when we teach this in catechism class, we use the, the letters S-O-S. The law shows our sins. The gospel shows our Savior. And so when you're reading God's Word or hearing God's Word, it's good to keep that in mind. What, what am I hearing right now? Is this law or gospel? Right? If your heart kind of feels guilty, it's probably the law. And that's good. You need to hear the law. But remember, if I hear the law, I need to hear the gospel too. These are the messages God uses. Okay, and the whole point of this is that if somebody doesn't recognize the Bible as God's Word, if somebody doesn't realize that the message of the Bible is salvation through faith in Jesus, and if that person has never heard about law and gospel, it's going to be hard for them to understand truly what the Bible said to them. Okay, does this make sense? So we ended last time with just some statements. When we read and study the Bible, we let Scripture interpret Scripture. We understand difficult passages of the Bible in light of clear passages. Okay, so it's certainly accurate to say there's parts of the Bible that are harder to understand than other parts. And so we use the parts that are clearer to help us understand the parts that are more difficult. Second one, we look to the context of each passage to understand its meaning. So, it's easy to pull a verse just out and use one verse. It's not wrong to just use one verse of the Bible. If you really want to know what that means, you need to look at what the other verses around it say. And last one, we we reject any interpretation that obscures salvation in Jesus or makes his law and gospel. So if you're talking with somebody and they say, yeah, you know, I think I think this passage is saying that we're saved by our good works. You could say, no, it can't be. It can't be saying that. Because it's not the message of the Bible. Okay, let's study the context. Let's look at this more. But I know it can't be saying that. Because that contradicts the whole message of the Bible. You ready to go on? We could just keep reviewing all day, but you ready? What we're going to do today is we're going to practice. We're going to practice what we learned interpreting the Bible. And so I have three different passages from the Bible, which sound really short and easy, but which are often misinterpreted. And we're going to do exactly what we said. We're going to read those passages. We're going to look at the context. We're going to look at what other passages in Scripture say. And we're going to try to come up with what does the Bible really say in these passages that are often twisted or used for wrong things. Make sense? The first one is this one. God is love. You ever heard that verse from the Bible before? It is actually a Bible verse. So sometimes when people say, you know, it doesn't actually come from the Bible, it actually is a Bible verse. 1 John 4.16 says, God is love. 
Right? In my opinion, this is probably one of the most popular verses in the Bible these days. Don't you hear that all the time? Say, well, God is love. God is love. Right? This is just people's go-to verse in the Bible. Without looking up anything else in the Bible, just having those three words, God is love, thinking about how you hear people use that verse, what are some possible interpretations if you just read that one verse by itself? Okay, now remember, this is the wrong thing to do. Right? So we're going to start by doing the wrong thing, and then we're going to do the right thing. But if I just see those three words, and I kind of let my imagination go, and I think about what I want the Bible to say, I hear God is love. What are some possible interpretations of that? God loves you just the way you are. God would never send people to hell. Everybody's going to hell. God is love. He never sent people to hell. Denise? God is only love. He's not firm, stern, demanding. Good. God is only love. Right? Don't worry about all the other things that you might find in the Bible. Don't worry about what Christians say. God is love. That's all you need to know. All God is, is love. John? It doesn't matter what I do. I, yeah. Like, God is love. I can, I can just do whatever I want. Anyway. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you look. God is love. He's kind of like, you know, that, that grandpa who just lets his grandkids do whatever they want to do. And he kind of sits in his easy chair with a beer and he just smiles. <laughs> you know, they're not my kids. You know, my kids have to worry about that. All right, that's... God is love. Okay? I think there's this one we could bring in, you know, with all the, the confusion about sexuality today. Just, God is love. And so God loves when people make love. It doesn't matter who the people are, but whoever it is, God is love. This is great. You know, whether it's homosexuality or sex outside marriage, God is love. Love is good. Love is love. My body, I can I do whatever I want, and I can have an abortion if I want. Right, right. It's my body. God, I, I can do whatever I want to do. God's love. I think we filled up your list there, didn't we? There's a lot of ways that you could just hear those words and make it say something that you wanted to say. Okay, but now if we really want to understand that verse, what do we need to do? We need to look at the context, and then beyond the context, we need to look at what is the rest of the Bible say. That's what, that's what we're trying to learn, right? This isn't complicated. So to find out what it means, I'm going to look at the context and look at what the rest of the Bible says. All right. So, we're on the third page in your study sheet. I have four different places that we're going to read from the Bible. For this one, they're all in the same book. <laughs> if you're thanking me now, you won't be thanking me later. <laughs> so, to understand this, well, we just really need to look at the book of 1 John. 1 John is just a great little book. So if you're trying to find it, it's way toward the end. You could start from the back. Revelation, Jude, and then there's the three little Johns. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But if you go backwards... Is that, yeah, yeah. One of you would have the books of the Bible memorized backwards. I'd be pretty impressed by that. <laughs> Revelation, Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. I could go that far. Alright, so 1 John. We're just going to read four sections from this little letter. 1 John is written from the Apostle John, Jesus' disciple. And it's written, it seems like, just to, to Christians in general. Just a letter to Christians with God's Word. So 1 John chapter 1, starting with verse 5. I'll start reading there. So again, we're thinking, God is love. How does this help us understand the verse? God is love. It says, this is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. 
God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will purify us from our sins, or will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is a really important section of God's Word. You'll notice we use some of those verses often in church when we confess our sins, right? At the beginning of the confession of sins. We'll say if anybody says they haven't sinned, they, they deceive themselves and the truth is not in them. Now we're thinking about the verse, God is love. How do these verses from 1 John chapter 1 and 2, how do they help us understand the verse God is love? It clarifies it. Excellent. In what way? Can't do many things that you want to do. Good. Think of those false interpretations that we came up with. So some of them were like, I can do whatever I want to do, or God doesn't care if I sin. What do these verses say about that? God does care if you sin. In fact, if if you don't care about your sins, what does God call you? A liar. Or deceived. Those are pretty strong words. Okay, so when, when it says God is love, it, it doesn't mean, well, God doesn't care about my sins. Because the same book of the Bible says you, you better care about your sins, and if you don't, then you're a liar who's been deceived. Is that law or gospel? Law. Right? There's this beautiful gospel in here, too, that goes with this verse. When the Bible says God is love, how do these verses help us understand that? That is who God is, that is not who we are. So that's who God is, that's not who we are. We're sinful, God is love. What did God do according to these verses? What did He do for us? He sent Jesus Christ to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And what promise does God give us related to our sins? He, he says, you can't hide them, don't ignore them, don't pretend they're not there, confess them, and if you do, Jesus' blood purifies us from all our sin. You're forgiven. Okay, so when we hear the verse, God is love, Instead of thinking to ourselves, I can do whatever I want to, what should be the first thing that comes to mind when I hear God is love? The cross of Jesus. The cross of Jesus. God is love because on the cross, Jesus died for all of my sins. And when I confess my sins, God is faithful and just. And he forgives me all my sins and purifies me from all unrighteousness. <laughs> Why? Bless you. Because God is love. Okay, do you see how that helps? Okay, now we could say, well, that's, that's enough. But we're really trying to go deep today, right? We're going to look at more. So I've got another reference for you on your sheet. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. So maybe it's on the same page. Maybe you got to turn one page. So we're going to read 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. Again, we're thinking, how does this help me understand God is love? It says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. 
The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Right, same, same thing. How do those three verses help us understand the verse, God is love? It actually tells us not to love. What are we not to love? The world and all of its sinful desires and passions and things of this world. Okay, now that sounds a little contradictory, right? Because we have this, well, God is love. That means I can love whatever I want to. Love is love. It's all good. And the Bible itself clarifies that. It says, loving God means not loving the world and all of its sinful things. Okay? So loving God is different than some of the love that we talk about in our world. This makes sense? And it actually says something really strong. It says that God's love is not in us sometimes. What does it say? Well, it actually makes the point that if our lives are filled with love for this world, then God's love is not in us at all. That's a really strong point, isn't it? Okay, is that law or gospel? That's law. All right, but it's, it's a warning. Love is a good thing. God is love. It's absolutely true. But understand, there's a difference between our sinful love for the world and its sinful things and God's love for us. And if, if we decide, I'm going to live my life loving the world, then we're not going to live a life that's full of God's love. can't serve two masters. Okay, you're going to love one and hate the other. You can't, you can't live on both sides. So how do we reconcile John 3.16? Good question, Randy. How would you answer that? I have no idea right now. <laughs> so so when, when John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, yeah. using the Bible... Just what you know about the Bible. What does it mean when it says the world? All of us. All of the people in the world. Okay, you're making a great point, Andy, that in these two verses, we have the, the phrase the world used in slightly different ways. Yeah. So in, in the book of John, it's an economy using... Oh, you just said a really big word, John. <laughs> what did you say? Metonymy? Yes. What's that? It's a literature term when you use a word uh, for something that is related to what you're actually talking about. Alright. So in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's clear that that phrase, the world, is referring to the people in the world. God absolutely loves all the people in the world. Right? So in John here, 1 John, when it's telling us, do not love the world or the things in the world, it's using the world in a little different sense, right? Instead of focusing on all the people in the world, it's thinking about the, the world, especially the sinful world, and sinful influences and desires. Excellent question. Okay, so we need to study this, right? Okay. A couple more verses. Turn to the... Well, turn to chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. This is where we actually find that verse, God is love. So here would be the immediate context of what that verse says. 1 John chapter 4, starting with verse 7. So we're thinking, God is love, what does this mean? Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If you keep going, he keeps on talking about love. How do those verses help us understand God is love? This is where that phrase actually comes in. Just like the first section that we read, what's the whole focus in these verses when it talks about love? What is love? It gives us a definition. It even says this is love. What does it say? Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atonement sacrifice. So whenever we hear about God's love, who do we think about? Jesus. 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 And so this phrase, God is love, is absolutely true, but it's not this permission to go out and sin. That's completely perverting what it's trying to say. God is love is this beautiful comfort. Look at what God has done for you in Jesus. And God's love for you in Jesus, that's what leads you to love God back, to love other people, to live in love and in light as God has called you to live. And so instead of being this, wow, God is love, I can do whatever I want to, and you better not judge me. God is love, so Jesus died on the cross for me, and that completely changes how I look at the world and how I look at God and how I look at other people. Does this make sense? He's showing us an example of what love is. Yes, yes. I'm just all. I'm just always careful when we use the word example for Jesus dying on the cross. We have to be careful because Jesus didn't die on the cross to be our example. He died on the cross to be our Savior. But then, once we see Jesus' love for us, that that is how we want to love other people. Absolutely, and that's what you were trying to say. That Jesus, his love for us, that's what motivates us to love other people. And so far from this, well, I can live however I want to live and do whatever I want to do, and God better accept me for it. It's, look at God's great love for us in Jesus. This changes us. Do you understand this? We're going to read one more little section, which is the next chapter. 1 John chapter 5. You probably don't even have to turn the page. First John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his Son as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. I think this is one of the most applicable verses in the Bible today. This is love for God. How does it finish? To obey His commands. So God is love that makes me think about Jesus and how Jesus died for me and He saved me and this changes me. And so now I love God. And how do I show my love for God? By following His commands. By following His commands. And so just think of how this phrase, God is love, it's used today as an excuse to commit as many sins as I want to when what it really means is I'm motivated to keep every single one of God's commands as, as best as I can by the Spirit of God that lives in me. Okay, so do you see how our interpretation of it, when we make it say whatever we want to say, is actually the complete opposite of the way that God explains it in the Bible. 
Okay? This is, this is so hard when couples come and they say, Oh, you know, we're living together, Pastor. And you say, well, you know, that's not what the Bible says. And they say, no, don't worry, we love God. And you say, well, you're not doing what, what God says that you should do. Well, that doesn't matter. We love God. And that's all that matters. Don't worry about us. We love God. And this is where I'll, I'll take people to. This is love for God to obey His commands. Okay? If you or I are not following God's commands and we're not sorry for it, if we're not repentant of it, what must that mean about us? We don't love God. We don't love God. Okay, the Bible's message isn't complicated. Okay, we can make it seem complicated, but love for God means I'm going to strive to carry out God's commands. And if I don't, and people point that out to me and I don't repent and I don't confess, then I can't say that I love God in my heart. I love that thing that I'm doing more than I love Jesus. The good news, of course, is what we started with in 1 John, that if I repent and confess my sins, then what happens? God forgives us. God forgives us all of our sins. And He purifies us from all unrighteousness. This phrase, God is love, it is a beautiful phrase. This is the Bible's message to us. And we want to understand it in the beautiful way that God spells it out for us. Not in our way, that we like to think of it in our world. Any questions about that? Or this verse? Okay, now, is this helpful? Do you see how we're practicing? Interpreting the Bible? Right, so here's another verse. James 2, verse 26. Faith without deeds is dead. Okay, this is... This is when, when Roman Catholics are upset at Lutherans. This is what they say. Okay, as Lutherans we teach that we're saved by faith in Jesus. And ever since the days of Martin Luther, what Catholic leaders have said is, you're wrong. We're not saved by faith in Jesus. Faith without deeds is dead. All right, so let's talk about this. This is a, this, I think you could say it's a difficult verse in the Bible. Again, without looking at anything else the Bible says, and I just, I kind of spoiled that by telling you something else the Bible says, but without looking at anything else the Bible says, if all that you knew was faith without deeds is dead, what would be some possible interpretations that you have? That you always have to do good deeds. You always have to do good deeds. If you're a Christian, you better never sin. You've got to work your way to heaven. You're not going to heaven. You've got to work your way to heaven. If you don't do all the right good deeds, you will not be in heaven. You can judge a person by what they do. So you're, you, it's good to judge somebody else based on what they do. If I don't see the right deeds in your life, I'm going to judge you for that. Well, don't you see that everywhere? You judge people by their actions, not by their words? Yeah, so just people by their actions. We're not saying that oh, everything we're saying at this moment is wrong, right? We're just listening. What, what would be things, thoughts that come to mind? You could, you could also say, well, if I'm a good person, I'll do So good people go to heaven. Bad people go to hell. You, you can tell whether or not somebody's going to heaven. If you just look at their life and you judge them hard enough. You just look at somebody's life, you can tell who's going to be in heaven. Okay. You can just make a guess. Please. Now, I, I'm going to say, not everything we just said right now is wrong. Some of those things you said are actually true. Okay, so we made this list again of, I see this verse. I know. We see this verse, and without studying context in other places, it, it's hard to know. There's a lot of possibilities for what this could be saying. And like I kind of introduced it by the biggest one would be people who say this verse proves that we're saved by the good things that we do. But faith really isn't what matters. It's the good things that we do. So, what do we need to do? I think we work out for it. 
We need to study the context and study what else does the Bible say. So, now this time Sam is not going to be happy with me because it's not all in the same book. We're going to bounce around a little bit, but we're going to start in the book of James. That's where this verse comes from, to see what the context is. So let's find James. If you were in 1 John, you're pretty close. Just go back. There's 2 Peter, 1 Peter, James. James chapter 1. James is written by Jesus' brother, James. Not by James the disciple, like Peter, James, and John. That James got executed very soon after Jesus ascended to heaven. Now Jesus' own brother was named James and became a believer in Jesus and wrote this. We're going to read James chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. This tells us who the book of James is written for. And that's important. The context of who it's written for is really important. So James chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered, scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So in ancient letters, you tell who you're writing to at the beginning of the letter. These first three verses tell us who the book of James is written for. Who is it written for? Yeah, what does that mean? So, first we think of the Jews. So it seems like a book specifically written to Jews. Who does the New Testament tell us are the people of God now? Not everyone. All who believe. Christians. So the book of James is written to people who already are Christians. You're kind of like, duh, it's in the Bible. You know that. <laughs> What's proof of that? Just in these three verses, it says to the twelve tribes of Israel, what term does James use to talk to the people he's writing to? My brothers. My brothers. Right? Maybe a newer translation says my brothers and sisters. He's, he's not just talking to men. He's talking to the people there, these Christians, my brothers and sisters. So he's not talking about unbelievers or people outside the church. He's writing to my, my brothers. And what does he say that they have? In verse 3. They have trials. And that trials, it does something to something they already have. Tests your faith. They already have faith. So right from the start, the book of James is written to people who already have faith in Jesus and are Christians. Why is that important? When you hear this verse, faith without deeds is dead. Why is it important to know those are words that are written to people who already are Christians and have faith in Jesus? This isn't the first thing you hear. This isn't the prerequisite for salvation. Yeah, it's not in the context of how do I get saved. The people James are writing, is writing to already know how they're saved. How are they saved? Through faith. He's writing to Christians who already have heard and believed that they're saved by faith in Jesus. This is important from God for them, faith without deeds and death. But, but it's not talking about how we get to heaven. Does this make sense? Okay, anybody else have a comment just on that part? Okay, so you wouldn't, maybe an application would be, if you have a friend who doesn't believe in Jesus, would it be appropriate for you to go up to them and say, faith without deeds is dead? No. No. Good. If you have a friend who doesn't believe in Jesus, what do you need to tell them? Jesus loves them. It's actually the next verse is what you need to tell them. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay? So, just to apply this, who would be somebody that you would say, faith without deeds is dead? Another 
somebody of faith. Another Christian, and what might be a situation where you might say this to another Christian? Where their faith is faltering. Maybe not where their faith is faltering. What would be faltering, though? You're on the right track. Their Christian life. Their Christian life. If there's someone who publicly professes to be a Christian, right? they say, I, I believe in Jesus, I know what the Bible says, I'm part of the Christian church, and yet in their, their Christian life, it doesn't look like they're Christians. That would be the kind of person that you would say, brother or sister, faith without deeds is dead. I'm thankful that you, you say you believe in Jesus, I pray that's true in your heart, but you need to remember what the Bible says. If you have faith in Jesus, you're going to follow that up by living a Christian life. We love because he first loved us. This makes sense? Get it? Well, what I think of, and I don't know if this is right or not, we, we're not going to have a perfect life. There are going to be trials and tribulations that we need to face. Mm -hmm. But with faith in Jesus, we can live through it. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, this, our faith in Jesus is what gets us through those trials and tribulations. That's what the book of James is a lot about, is persecution that Christians were facing. And our faith in Jesus is what gets us through that. Okay, Dan? It tells me faith without deeds is dead. Is if, if nobody can see that I'm a Christian, then I might as well not have Excellent. Have any faith at all. So there are words for a Christian. If nobody can tell that I'm a Christian by the way I live my life. There's something that's wrong. There's a problem there. Because faith without deeds is dead. Okay, let's look at the other passages we have here. So you're going to have to go back to the Gospel of John. So you're going backwards. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you can hit any of those four, then you know where you're at. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we'll read verses 16 to 18. know John 3.16. It's probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. But John 3.17 and 18, add to it. Okay? So once again, we're thinking about this verse. Faith without deeds is dead. We're trying to understand what it means. Here's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. How does that help us understand this verse? Faith without deeds is dead. Good, so people without faith are already dead. This section answers without a shadow of a doubt the question, how is somebody saved? How is somebody saved? Whoever believes in Jesus. And I say it's without a shadow of a doubt because it also explains how somebody goes to hell. Who is the person that is condemned? Those who don't believe. Okay, where in John 3, 16 and 18 does it say, well, bad people go to hell and good people go to heaven? It doesn't. Going to heaven is completely by faith. Going to hell is because I don't have faith. So what does faith without deeds is dead absolutely not mean? That you can earn your way to heaven. That you can earn your way to heaven. That would contradict the message of the rest of the Bible. Okay, are you following this? Okay, so faith without deeds is dead is not telling us how we're saying. That's your faith in Jesus. It's written to Christians, telling us that if we have faith, it's going to show in our lives. Let's read two more passages. Let's not read them in order. 
So it's easier to find them. We're in John. So just go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Here's Jesus talking about our, our lives as Christians. And he's comparing us to a grapevine where he is the, the vine and we're the branches. Look at what he says. John chapter 15. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. <coughs> so this is a picture of a vine and branches. And I, I don't know a lot about grapevines. Where I'm from, there's apple trees. So sometimes it helps me to think a little more of an apple tree. It's the same picture. There's the tree and there's the branches and it produces fruit. Right? If you think about that, before a branch can produce any fruit, what is, has to happen first? You're all thinking too too far ahead. If a branch is going to produce fruit, it has to be connected to the tree. Okay, that, that's it's too obvious, right? That's why you don't say it. If a branch is going to produce fruit, it has to be connected to the tree. Because where does all of the strength to produce fruit come from? From the roots. Okay, now Jesus is comparing this with him and us. He's the tree, we're the branches. Before I produce any good fruit, what has to happen? I have to be connected to Jesus. Okay, so which comes first, faith or works? Faith comes first, because where does all of the strength to do good things come from? From, from Jesus. Okay, I think this is such a good picture. I need that faith in Jesus first that connects me, a branch, to the tree. Faith is what connects me to Jesus. Faith is what saves me. But once a, a branch on a fruit tree is connected to a tree, what is it always going to do? Produce fruit. Okay, and if God the Father is the gardener, if you have a fruit tree, how much fruit do you want your tree to produce? A lot. All right, this is how the Bible talks about good works. They're impossible without faith in Jesus. Once I'm connected to Jesus, though, and Jesus is working through me, and his word is working through me, I'm going to produce more and more and more and more good fruit. Does this make sense? Yeah. And what if you look at a tree, and that tree has a branch on it that has no leaves and no fruit on it? What do you know about that branch? It's dead. It's dead, right? You cut it off. You cut it off not because it might be dead, You cut because it it's dead. If there's a branch on a tree that has no leaves or fruits, it's no longer connected to the, the vine, to the, the tree. It's, it's dead. Okay? So, faith without deeds is dead. You see what that means? Right? If I have faith in Jesus, I'm going to produce good works. If I don't produce any good works, what can people assume about me? I don't have faith. Faith without deeds is dead. It's not telling me I have to work my way to heaven. It's not telling me I'm saved by good works. What it's telling me is that when I have faith in Jesus, that's going to show in my life. So as we were listing all of the possible interpretations, I said some of the things that you were saying were actually true. Do you know which ones that you were saying that you were, were actually true? 
Jesus tells us, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Is it true that you can look at someone's life and, without being 100% certain, you can reasonably guess whether they have faith in Jesus? Sure. Jesus says yes. In fact, he tells us to do that. It's especially in the context of false teachers. If false teachers come to you and proclaim a message, Jesus says, well, look at their life and see if they produce the fruit that matches being a, a teacher of God's Word. And if not, don't listen. Because if they don't have deeds, what's probably true about their faith? It's dead. So the Bible, you know, we live in such a non-judgmental world. The Bible tells us to judge. It tells us to start with ourselves, right? Worry about the plank in your own eye before you worry about the speck in somebody else's eye. But Jesus just says it. He's telling us you need to you need to judge. And as Christians, God says, it, it's okay to look at someone's life and to say, you know, Nathan, you say that you're a Christian, but I don't see it. I'm, I'm just just an example. And it's not actually true. <laughs> but that's what you can you can say to somebody. And say it humbly, right? And be willing to be corrected. And maybe somebody else is standing there and they say, Well, you know, Pastor, you don't you don't know Nada like I do. And when I'm around Nada, I, I can see every day her faith in Jesus. And, I mean, well that, that's great. Okay, but faith faith without deeds, it, it's dead. Sam? This is something you're only talking to other Christians about. Mm -hmm. The unbelieving world, to say that would mean nothing <laughs> to them whatsoever. Yes. Excellent. So it's a passage meant for believers, or at least for people who claim to be believers, right? So if there's anybody who claims to be a Christian, and you, you say, well, if you claim to be a Christian, that means you give me the right to look at your life and see if you're following God's word. And of course, if I do that to you, you have the right to do that back to me, right? God wants us as Christians to, to look for fruit in our own lives and in the lives of other people. Okay, I was just talking with John before the class. You, John, you brought up the fruit of the Spirit. It's exactly what we're talking about here, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And so if someone claims to be a Christian, according to the Bible, that's what a Christian looks like. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay? And so, one, that's what we examine our lives against every day. And what do we have to do? Repent and confess our sins. But two, if there's somebody, I think especially of prominent people who say, I'm a Christian, you should believe me, and I'm an example for everybody, you have a right to look at their life and see if it's filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if it's not, then, you know, I wouldn't really follow what they say. Because faith without deeds is dead. I really want us to read the last verse that's here. I know we're almost out of time. But Ephesians chapter 2. So you're in John. You're going to go forward ahead in the Bible. So it's after John, after John comes Acts, then Romans, then 1st and 2nd Corinthians, then Galatians, then Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 2, we'll read verses 8 to 10. And this section just, just puts it perfectly. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Verses 8 and 9 are 
some of our, our favorite verses to use in the Lutheran Church. Because they state it as clearly as possible. How are we saved? By grace, By grace through faith, not because of what? The righteous things we do. Not because of our works, so that no one can boast. It's all by faith. And then what does verse 10 tell us to do? <laughs> Go do good works. Isn't that great? This is how the Bible speaks. Right? We like to think, well, which one is it? If I'm saved by faith, then I can just live however I want to. If I'm saved by works, then it's not by faith. And God says, no, 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 no. You are saved by faith in Jesus, by God's grace. And once you're saved by faith in Jesus, what are you going to do? Good works. And like a couple of good works or a lot of good works? A lot of good works. All right? You want to do only good works. You actually have good, proper motivation to do it. And so hopefully, in our lives as Christians, people can look at us and say, this is a person who does lots of good deeds. We want people to say that. These are people who do lots of good works, not to earn our way to heaven, but because we know we're going to heaven. Not to earn God's love, but because we know that we have God's love. And every once in a while, when our lives aren't matching up with what we say, what should somebody say to us? Faith without deeds is dead. This makes sense? This is age related, right? <laughs> age related? Oh, we are going to get saved. <laughs> I'm glad that we could go through all this. Okay? This is an example of studying the Bible. We take a verse that maybe you're not quite sure what it means. Maybe you've heard differing explanations. And you don't throw up your hand and say, oh, I don't know. It's just your interpretation. You say, let's look at what the Bible says. And the Bible will lead us not only to understand the verse, but to see how, how important it is for us and for our faith in Jesus. Okay, there's one on here that we didn't get to that you can do at home. Did you know you can study the Bible at home? You can. It works. And this is a ready-made way for you to do that. One last verse. With the, day, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years are like a day. If you want to, at, at home this week, think of what might that mean. Look up the passages that are there and see what does God really mean when he says those words which are often misused. Okay, all of us can grow in our ability to study God's word. Thanks for being here today. Keep on coming back. Bring other people with you. It's great to have lots of people studying God's Word. We'll be talking about this at least two more weeks, about how to, how to read the Bible, letting God speak. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, your Word is amazing. We know that it's true. We know that it tells us about you. We know that we're saved by faith in you as our Savior. Dear Jesus, we want to grow in our understanding of your Word. And not just that, we want to grow in our understanding of how to read and study your Word. I think it was good for us today to look at these two passages. God is love and faith without deeds is dead. Lord, these are really important passages from your word. We're thankful that by looking at the context and the rest of scripture, we can see how these verses apply to us and to our lives. Dear Jesus, give us a desire, a hunger, to grow in our knowledge of you and our faith in your word. And bless us as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.